Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Happy New Year. Before I even get started with anything else, have a happy, happy New Year. Um, I meant to say it yesterday on actually uh, New Year Day, but I was too busy drinking soup jumu. So to all my Haitians that are watching that had their wonderful bowls of soup jumu, I had mine too. So, okay, guys, on this video, I'm going to be covering endometriosis. Before I get started, please don't forget to like this video. You're going to love it. So like it now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And I, uh, I also cover other uh, nursing content on my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. All right, guys. So let's get started. Let's take a look. Endometriosis. What is it? It says that endometriosis is characterized by the presence and growth of endometrial tissue. Here's the key, guys. That's why I highlighted in pink. Outside of the tissue, excuse me, outside of the uterus. So think about this for a second. Endometriosis, endo. Whenever you see a word saying endo, that means inner lining, right? The most inner of. So inner lining of the uterus. Endometrial tissue is supposed to be inside of the uterus, but what this is telling us is that the person who has endometriosis has growth of that tissue that's supposed to be inside of the uterus, the actual innermost lining, it's growing outside of the uterus. All right, why is that a problem? Let's take a look. Oh, before we take a look, I want you to see this. You see these little dots that they have in blue? These are different places that the endometrial tissue, remember that inner lining where it's supposed to be on the inner part of the uterus, but it's growing outside of the uterus. It's showing all the different locations outside of the uterus that that tissue grows. Now, I want you to think about the job of the um, endometrial tissue. And so what would happen if it's growing in the wrong place? It's growing outside of your uterus instead of inside of the uterus. Let's take a look. All right. So it says endometrial tissue contains uterine glands and stroma. That's connective tissue. Look, and responds to cyclic hormonal stimulation in the same way that the uterine endometrium does, but often out of phase with it. So, you know, when you're, you know, your hormones are fluctuating, it's time for you to have your um, cycle. Well, guess what? This is still happening, but it's happening outside of the uterus. Those those um, um, spasms that you sometimes feel during your cycle, it's happening outside of the uterus. Let's take a look. And the second part of it also, guys, even though it's happening, it's happening outside of the uterus, often it's not even in... Um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this because it says often out of phase with it. It's not even happening at the same time that's supposed to be happening within the uterus, okay? Take a look. During or immediately after menstruation, the tissue bleeds. But remember, guys, the tissue is not inside of the uterus where it's supposed to be. So during or immediately after the you go through the menstrual cycle, the tissue bleeds, resulting in an inflammatory response with subsequent fibrosis and adhesions to adjacent organs. So what's the saying? During the menstrual cycle or immediately after, those tissues that are outside of the uterus starts to bleed. That bleeding causes an inflammatory response, but that inflammatory response is happening where that endometrial tissue is located. Again, look at all these areas that it can happen. So the patient can have inflammatory response here, abdomen, anywhere outside of the uterus, uterus, okay? That's that word. When you see subsequent, that means after. So that inflammatory response causes subsequent fibrosis. So now you're having hardening of the tissue and adhesion sticking to adhesions to adjacent organs. So now those tissues that are outside of the uterus that's causing inflammation is now being hardened and they're sticking to other organs. Let's keep going. The major symptoms of endometriosis are pelvic pain. Well, obviously, look at all the different places in the pelvic area that this tissue can be located. Of course, the patient's going to have pelvic pain. Let's keep going. Dysmenor dysmenorrhea, right? 
it's they're gonna have painful um cycles and they can have difficult cycles absolutely this perineum, this is painful intercourse. Women may also have chronic non-cyclical pelvic pain, pelvic heavy, heaviness, or pain radiating into the thighs. So let's talk, talk about this because there's a word I want you to notice. It says that women may have chronic non-cyclical, which means that even though they're not on their cycle, they may still have this pain. Why is that, Professor D? Remember, look at what we saw up here where it says sometimes it's out of phase with the patient cycle. So at least, you know, your regular woman of childbearing age, if she's having, you know, cyclical pain, she knows that, you know, she's going to have it for three to five days once a month, right? But the person with endometriosis, not only can they have these symptoms during the cycle, they can have it outside of the cycle. Why? Because of those tissues that are outside of the uterus, they're not in sync with the uterus, with the inner lining of the uterus. Okay, so that's important to, to catch. Let's keep going. Many women report bowel symptoms such as diarrhea, pain with defecation, and constipation caused by avoiding defecation because of the pain. So what happens, it hurts so much to have the bowel movements. They don't want to strain. They don't want to have the bowel movements. So that um, feces just sits there and hardens and it gets even worse. I want you guys to take a look again. Look at this visual il illustration. Look at the anus and look at um, the, the rectum and the GI tract and look at all these places outside of the uterus that the tissue can grow. So it makes sense that the patient may have lots of problems with um, defecating, right? Other symptoms include abnormal bleeding, hypermenorrhea, where they're bleeding um, excessively, menorrhagia or premenstrual staining, and pain during exercise as a result of adhesions. Uh, this, these tissues actually sticking to other organs, okay? Impaired fertility can result from the adhesions. Again, these tissues sticking to other organs. Impaired fertility may result from um, adhesions around the uterus that pull the uterus into a fixed retroverted position. Now, think about it. That uterus is in a fixed retroverted position. How is it going to be able to um, support the fetus, not possible, or very hard to, I should say. Management. Women without pain who do not want to become pregnant need no treatment. If they're not experiencing these symptoms and they're not trying to actively become pregnant, there's no need for it. But in women that have mild pain, who may desire future pregnancy, treatment can be limited to the use of NSAIDs during menstruation because during menstruation, that's when they tend to, uh, the pain tends to be the worst. Suppressions of endogenous estrogen production and subsequent endometrial lesion growth is the cornerstone of management of the disease. All right, that sentence just said a mouthful and you have to absolutely understand what they're saying. So let's start with the first part. Suppression of endog endogenous estrogen. So suppressing the natural um, estrogen that the body makes, that's a cornerstone. Because remember, that hormone is part of um, um, the cause of this whole domino effect of what's happening, right? So suppressing that natural endogenous estrogen that the body makes will also help with suppressing the lesion growth. And that is the cornerstone of management. Whenever you see that word cornerstone when you're studying, highlight it, put a star next to it. That is very important for you to know. That means this is the most important part of management. Everything on management is going to be based around this. That is the cornerstone of management of the disease. Two classes of medications are used to, again, suppress the endogenous. That means naturally occurring, not an outside source, but to suppress the naturally occurring estrogen that's being produced. GnRH agonists and adrogen derivatives. Those are the two, okay? And they give you these two medicate, um, those two, the medications. I'm not even gonna try to uh, pronounce them. You see them? 
let's keep going. A medically induced menopause develops, resulting in anvolution, even though I can't pronounce, I'm gonna try to pronounce it, anvolation and amenorrhea. The hyperestrogenism results in hot flashes in almost all women. And I said hyper, I'm sorry, I meant hypo because remember we're suppressing the estrogen. So think about it, just like a woman who's naturally going through menopause and the estrogen is severely decreased, that's what this patient is going to be going through because remember that that steroid, that that I mean that hormone, that estrogen is being decreased, okay? So same thing, the woman who's going through menopause, how she will experience um, hot flashes because of the hypoestrogen state, the woman who's taking medications to suppress that endogenous estrogen will experience the same thing. What else do we know about women who are going through menopause that their estrogen is very low? Well, we know that they're at risk for osteoporosis because one of the important things that estrogen does, guys, it keeps the calcium in the bones where they're supposed to be so the bones can be strong. But once the estrogen level decreases, the calcium's like, oh, party time, there's nothing keeping us in the bones. Let's go hang out in the bloodstream. And so the bones become porous and the patient's at risk for osteoporosis. So any patient that has endometriosis and they're taking medications to suppress that endogenous estrogen level are at risk for not only hot flashes, but bone loss. Okay. Trabecular bone loss is common, although um, most loss is reversible within 12 to 24 months after medication is stopped. And again, they talk about the medications. You guys uh, can read up on those medications on your own. Women who have early symptomatic disease and who can postpone pregnancy can be treated with continuous... What's OCP stand for? Hmm. I have, what's OCP stand for? I have no idea. Guys, if one of you, I hate when they do this in the book. If one of you know what the OCP stands for, please let me know in the comment section. I have no idea. What's OP, OCP? It's not coming to me. Let me know in the um comments if you know what the OCP is. But anyway, um, Women who have early symptomatic disease who can postpone pregnancy can be treated with continuous OCPs that have a low estrogen to progesterone ratio to shrink endometrial tissue. I think OCP stands for a type of um, oral contraceptive. That has to be what it means. I'm almost 100% sure, but let me know in the comments, okay? But anyway, they can be um, they can take low estrogen to progesterone ratio to shrink the endometrial tissue. I'm almost 100% sure that's what they're talking about, oral contraceptives. The OCPs are taken continuously for six to 12 months without any withdrawal time of the OCP. It has to be oral contraceptive. This approach is believed to lead to more complete suppression, thus decreasing the endometriosis. Oh, here we go. Continuous combined hormonal therapy, OCP, estrogen progesterone patch, estrogen progesterone vaginal ring for menstrual suppression and administration of NSAIDs are the usual treatment for adolescents younger than 16 years of age who have endometriosis. So this, you guys will see again when you get to peds and they're talking about endometriosis in the adolescence. Lastly, for women who do not want to preserve their ability to have children, look at this. The only, remember what I told you about when you see that word only, when you're studying and you see only, never, always pay attention. The only definite cure is a total abdominal hysterectomy with bilateral salpingectomy and oophorectomy. That is the only 100 way, 100% 100 way to cure this, getting rid of it all. Okay. And so anyway, guys, that is the endometriosis in 
a nutshell. Please let me know what you thought about this video, guys. I know I've been gone. I've been gone for like three weeks, but I've been working on a huge project that I've just been putting off and I could not afford to put off any longer. Um, but I'm trying to get back to my regular schedule. I don't know if I'm going to be able to post every single day the way that I used to, because again, I have a huge project I'm working on, but I will try to make videos for you as much as possible. But as always, Every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a video is released, a video where I go over uh, test questions, how to answer them, how to eliminate wrong answer choices. And then almost daily, if you still want to go over nursing content, you guys can watch my videos. I have different videos that I make on um, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So guys, thank you so much for watching this video, and you guys will catch me on the next video.